All right, so it is my pleasure to introduce my colleague, my dear friend, and our president, Candace Chu. Yes. <laughs> It feels weird to call you Chu, but I'm going to call you Chu. <laughs> Chu is professor of English and American Studies at the City University of New York's Graduate Center, where she is also appointed to the faculty of the MA in Liberal Studies. She is the co-editor with Karen Shimakawa of Orientations, Mapping Studies in the Asian Diaspora, as well as the highly influential Imagine Otherwise on Asian Americanist Critique which was the winner of the 2003 Laura Romero Prize from the ASA. <laughs> Imagine Otherwise is a sophisticated interrogation of the contradictions of ethnic studies generally and Asian American studies particularly. More to the point, Chu's powerful book exposes the tensions between the place of identity politics within much of Asian American studies and the diverse constitution of Asian American communities, a constitution that interrupts identitarian notions of symmetry, consensus, and homogeneity as an alternative to those identitarian impulses and as a way of maneuvering the field's critical stances toward difference, Chu theorized Asian American studies as a subjectless discourse. By subjectless, she referred to a critical and interdisciplinary politics that is alternative to the politics of identity, one in which Asian American studies would, in all of its various projects, work to reveal the constructedness of Asian American subjectivity and identity. In this very brilliant maneuver, Chu upset the presumption that agency, whether political, critical, or institutional, depends upon the fiction of a coherent subjecthood and identity. As her theorization of subjectless discourse underscored this fact, it not only advanced Asian American studies, but all of the interdisciplinary fields that are captivated by identity. In her forthcoming book, the difference aesthetics makes on the humanities after man, Chu turns her attention to the possibilities of an alternative genealogy of aesthetic formations. Here, she argues that we have been overtrained in the critique of the aesthetic, understanding the aesthetic as only the plaything of liberalism. In doing so, we have been trained not to see the ways in which the aesthetic, as it is produced and handled, by the minoritized, the dispossessed, the colonized, the queer, and the wretched is also the possibly insurgent formation produced by what the dominant aesthetic mode has devalued. Relatedly, she insists that thinking through the human is an incomplete and unfinished project. If bourgeois liberalism's claim on the human tells only part of the story, occluding the elaboration of knowledge of the human by minoritized subjects and communities, critical thinking on the human is still worth our time and energy. Tonight's presidential address is entitled Pedagogies of Dissent. Please welcome our president, Candace Chu. are really kind of amazing. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna say that all that applause is for Rod, who is who is an extraordinary human, um, and one of the great gifts has been getting to work with him a lot. Actually, sitting in a lot of small rooms and um, and feeling energized by it, which is which is uh, unexpected. Um, I'm I'm you know thank you so much for being here this evening, um, for being at this conference. Um, 
I think this, uh, I waited a long time for this evening, really just so I can say thank you, because there are so many people uh, who are involved in, who have been involved in producing this, but in, in many, many different ways, um, some formal, some informal. Um, so I'm really delighted to have the opportunity finally to say thanks um, to Rod um, for the lovely introduction. Um, to John Stevens, um, not just for this, for this conference, but um, there are countless numbers of ways in which he is the infrastructure of this association. Um, and I don't know anyone who cares for this association as much as John does. I think we all love it in some way, but I think John actually um, might be it, actually. So, um, so if you see him, you know, gi give him a thanks. Um, yeah. He's sitting in the back over there. Yeah. <coughs> I also want to thank uh, Molly Benitez and Mike Cassiano. Are you guys in the room somewhere? I know Mike promised to be for tech reasons. So. Yes, they're over here. Um, they are uh, working with the ASA this year as um, our graduate assistants, um, but they are also scholars in their own right and uh, emerging um, thinkers and intellectuals, and they have been instrumental to getting everything done. Um, so I'm really grateful to have gotten to know them a little bit and for their assistance. Um, Christine Buziak, who is our conference uh, organizer, our conference coordinator from uh, INMEX, the, the association um, of which actually John Stevens is president, and uh, who helps us put, put these conferences on with attention to labor issues, with attention to um, the politics of the places that we hold them. Um, she's done a tremendous job for us, and it, it is kind of extraordinary to me how quickly she can respond to emails sent uh, pretty much all night long. Um, Thank you also to, to all of the, the um, tech crew who have been really kind to me this evening, but also who have been working with us throughout the, throughout the um, conference. Um, I, you know, there are the formal committees of the, uh, the association as well, the standing committees, um, the caucuses, the prize committees, um, all of you who are contributing your labor, your volunteer labor, the things that you are doing on top of your day jobs, basically, um, all of that is what makes this work. Um, and I, I thank you on behalf of all of us, on behalf of the association. Um, uh, let me see if I can make this work. Our site resources committee, if you have done any of the events that are listed on the site, um, the off-site events, um, you will have discovered how amazing they have been. Um, Rod, uh, E. Patrick Johnson, Nadine Neighbor, um, Naomi Pack, uh, Ivy Wilson, um, really uh, came to the table with ideas about how to realize the notion of pedagogies of dissent out in the world, um, and I'm really grateful. I want to say a particular thanks to Ivy Wilson, um, who, you know, one of the things that is the, the most distressing about this job is that you have to go and ask people for money um, to support the conference and to support things, and Ivy Wilson really stepped up, and he, did, he made it really easy, and um, I think he did it because he actually believes in the kind of work that we do collectively, so I'm really grateful to him. The president's reception after this address is sponsored by Northwestern University, which is not my home institution. <laughs> it's my Northwestern <laughs> University. Um, with a little bit of additional contribution from the CUNY Grad Center, which <laughs> is where I work. So, uh, so I am grateful to the contribution that CUNY was able to make. We are, like all public schools, under a lot of financial duress. Um, so, you know, the, they showed up, and so I'm grateful to them. Um, my biggest thanks has to be for the annual meeting program committee. Um, uh, Laura Kang, led by Laura Kang, Siobhan Somerville, Alex Vasquez, um, Alexandra T. Vasquez, uh, Cindy Chang, Laura Gutierrez, Nicole King, Regina Kunzel, Edwin Mayorga, Beth Piatote, Ronaldo Walcott, Shiming Yang. These people are unbelievable. Um, I think every president says that their program committee is the best. Mine was the best. And it's not only because of what they brought to the table, but the way that they did it. And with incredible uh, sense of mutuality and incredible willingness to, to be there, um, to follow up on a lot of email chasing, 
um, and a lot of hard work. It's just a lot of hard work to put this forward and to put this together, and I hope that you've all been a able to enjoy some of it. Um, the, the sessions that I've been able to go to uh, have been really wonderful, so I'm grateful to them. Um, Laura, Siobhan, and Alex, I, I can't actually say enough good things about you. I will say that because in these last uh, weeks I have been so overwhelmed with a sense of affection and admiration and love for them that the end of my address gets kind of pretty and I think I'm just going to blame it on them. So it's really their fault for having produced that. Um, I want to give a shout out to Martin Manalansan. I saw you before, I don't know where you are right now. Yes. Who who started this journey with us um, and was key to helping us uh, think through the theme of, of, the, of the conference and um, took a detour, had to take a detour along the way, but was, is very much always a part of, of the ways in which we think. So, um, We are setting a record at this conference. We have about 2,500 people here, which we are the biggest conference that the ASA has ever staged. Um, yeah. It's kind of great. Um, and then I was thinking about that number as I was at the, uh, at the session this afternoon or this morning um, on the Combahee River Collective Statement. I don't know if, if any of you were there. It was kind of extraordinary. Um, it, for, for many reasons, it was extraordinary. Uh, one of the things that that session did in the beginning was to, and, and this was prompted by Alexis Pauline Gum, and the session was organized by Courtney Baker, um, it was to actually ask everybody in the room to dedicate their presence in the room to somebody who was not there, right? So I'm not going to do that because there's actually a lot of us here. Um, but uh, I thought that that might be a way of thinking about who's not with us and of actually thinking about who is with us even if they're physically not here. Right. Um, so in that spirit, I wanted to think about the teachers and the families and the students and all the people who actually made it possible for us to be here. So my address is inspired by all of you, past, uh, pa you know, present in body and not present, um, and maybe particularly is for the second row um, on this side, or constituted by the people I get to work with, um, who you know, under the title of my advisee, but who are actually just colleagues in a different guise. Okay, so pedagogies of dissent, <clears throat> uh, and the talk runs about 40 minutes, okay. Um, that academic freedom is under attack is something of a commonplace observation, and understandably so. There is ample evidence to be drawn from across the world and more locally in support of such a claim. The Scholars at Risk Network's recent publication, Free to Think 2017, covers 257 reported attacks on higher education communities in 35 countries in just the past year. These include the violent suppression of organized student protests by state authorities in Venezuela, South Africa, Niger, Cameroon, Turkey, and India, as well as the repression through travel restrictions in such countries as China, Turkey, Israel, Uganda, Thailand, and the United States. The report also includes legislative activities that threaten the autonomy and viability of higher education institutions, a phenomenon clearly notable in the US. The consequences of all this, scholars at risk finds, runs the gamut from killings and disappearances to restrictions on the content of teaching and research to fines, dismissal, and imprisonment. Other organizations and studies report similar repressive and suppressive activities, and importantly take note of the growing influence of private interests, corporations, and overtly ideological organizations on restrictions to academic freedom. In brief, there is no shortage of evidence that academic freedom is insecure, fragile, vulnerable. In the United States, we know that such vulnerability across all levels of education is produced through a wide range of state and state authorized activities, including the Arizona anti-ethnic anti studies movement and legislation, the enactment in 10 states and the pending status of legislation and several others of campus carry laws providing for the possession of concealed weapons in public universities and colleges, the intensive defunding of public schools, again, at all levels, bathroom bills that regulate access to public facilities, the promised defunding of science and especially climate research, and the re repeated attempts at both the state and federal levels to enact laws that would refuse public funding or otherwise penalize individuals and institutions who criticize Israel in any way. Indeed, people who have mounted criticisms of Israel or have spoken out against racism or sexualized violence have found themselves targets of administrative censure and have faced aggressive harassment through online campaigns. 
the autonomy of both educational institutions and educators upon which the principle of academic freedom is grounded, arguably always fictional, is these days aggressively challenged by both state activities and by the unfettered incursions of the interests of capital, as well as by private ideologically driven groups. All this contributes to the sense that we are under siege, that public education in particular, and especially higher education, is in crisis, and that both it and its uh, and that it and both its current and aspirational communities need defense. The question that has long been and currently resurges before us is the matter of how to respond, how to protect and defend colleges and universities from unwanted and unwarranted intrusion by non-academic forces. It is this question I linger with in my remarks today. An enormous amount of literature already exists that details the conditions we currently face, including some that provide strategies for mobilizing against them. My remarks are differently skewed, though similarly oriented. This evening, I take, I take what I think of as a pedagogical approach to the question of defense, to raise some questions I believe necessary to engage in the formulation of responses to the current scene. For it seems to me there is work to do in sinking into the question of defense, or more precisely, to question defensiveness itself and the defensive posture that current conditions at least try to impose so strongly upon us. This work is related to what we do as people committed to thinking hard together in our capacities as teachers, students, and scholars, sometimes all at once. To my mind, while there is no question of the need to stand by and with people living the consequences of expressing dissent, there are many that arise in relation to the defense of academic freedom, a principle, or the university, an institution. I want to bring to bear how we fight against defensiveness, our own as well as our students, in classroom, set in, uh, in classroom settings, in perhaps tacit recognition of how it ca is categorically antithetical to learning, uh, 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 antithetical to learning, of how defensiveness as a self-justificatory stance serves as a form of an ego-driven protection of one's own rightness and, uh, and results in the in unwillingness to entertain error in one's own position. Such defensiveness inhibits learning, prohibits collaboration, and makes collegiality, groupness, or in other words, robust support of each other difficult, if not impossible. I'm asking us to bring this awareness of the effects of defensiveness to our thinking about the vulnerability of academic freedom and what that vulnerability tells us about contemporary conditions, and to do so by working in a pedagogical mode. I'm asking us, that is, to do so by thinking into the time stretched out by the intentionally pedagogical to allow for the thickening and potential transformation of understanding. More specifically, by doing so, my aim is to think with and through the streams of thought that in, over, uh, in often overlapping forms and under the administrative rubrics of queer of color critique, women of color feminism, native and indigenous studies, black studies, ethnic studies, and decolonial discourses, among others, enjoin us to disidentify from the pedagogies of dissent that, however inadvertently, feed rather than defunction the systems producing the conditions that induce dissent in the first place. Primary among such pedagogies is the nationalism that carries forward liberalism and neoliberalism in the United States, the values of which arguably have become dominant intellectual values through not only the historical foundations upon which education has been built, but also, I will suggest, the structured embrace of academic freedom in a liberal key. The declaration that academic freedom is under attack accordingly acts here as an invitation to identify the conditions that give such statements traction who and what are being attacked and by whom, how and why, but also what histories are brought forward and which are occluded, what ideologies are affirmed and which are discounted by the assumed value of academic freedom accompanying declarations of its besieged state. I want to remember how the pedagogical refuses the reactive temporalities of, and the, of the language and production of crisis, temporalities that are fundamentally anti-intellectual in their inhibition of thoughtful consideration. Certainly, the rapidity with which highly objectionable, dissent-inducing events and actions are these days pressed upon us is, in an important sense demands reactive immediacy. It is breathtaking, literally for some, to experience and apprehend the manifold ways the U.S. state in its partnership with capitalism innovates to diminish life. The need for immediate redress is clear in, face of the, uh, in the face of the state's aggressive abandonment of people, its refusal to provide basic needs to the people of Puerto Rico, for example, and by its efforts to eliminate the already very minimal affordance that DACA offers to undocumented students, as well as by its efforts to restrict travel and entry, 
its plans to defund health care, especially women's, to divert public monies to corporations and away from student loan programs, the list goes on. This cascading cruelty has given rise to what I have elsewhere called protest nationalism, to refer to uh, expressions of dissent aligned with and framed by the rationalities of the US nation state. Protest nationalism remains faithful to the idea of the fundamental goodness of US liberal democracy and identifies its re retrievability from the hands of a spastic executive anomalous to the nation's otherwise laudable if imperfect past as source of political hope and objective. It is in this way a form of consent in the cloak of dissent. Of protest nationalism, we might say, simply, metonymically, and empirically speaking, we are not all immigrants, nor do we aspire to be. The availability and traction of that slogan as a response to US exclusionary nationalism attests to the continuing potency of the liberal nation state as the framework that governs dominant understandings and imagination of both US history and its possible futures. Stretch time around academic freedom and in ways mindful of these normative nationalist pedagogies of dissent, and it becomes sharply clear that contestations over academic freedom bespeak what Edward Said describes as the nationalization of intellectual activity through formal education. Like Said, I want, here to I want to raise the question of how the central importance and authority given to national identity impinges on and greatly influences, surreptitiously and often unquestioningly, what transpires in the name of academic freedom. The project that emerges, and in some respects, uh, some important respects has long been ongoing, is not, I think, one of decentering the nation or transnationalizing our paradigms but rather may be understood as the delegitimation of the authority of the US nation state and the bourgeois liberalism that secures it by the elaboration and activation of frameworks and sensibilities fundamentally incommensurate to it. All of this is to remember that dissent is in itself not an end, but instead a point of departure. The question is, where will we go and how will we get there? So the remainder of the talk is structured in three sections um, and I think it'll run about 30 minutes. Section one, um, a brief history of professionalization or the ruse of academic freedom. <laughs> Many of you will recognize that I'm riffing Lisa Lowe in using this phrase, the ruse of academic freedom. In Intimacies of Four Continents, Lowe resoundingly details how freedom as given to us by liberalism is a ruse that covers over the ongoingness of unfreedoms organized by colonialism and settler colonialism, racial capitalism and empire. Freedom as narrated under and by liberalism denies slavery in its afterlife and disavows the dispossession of the land and lives of indigenous peoples. Liberalism in this way develops freedom for a narrow portion of humanity under the sign of Western man, while simultaneously subjugating all others as not yet and perhaps never to be capable of its possession. Liberal freedom in this regard must be understood to belie its materiality, its uses against people and the worlds we inhabit in the name of humanity, and its evocation must cause pause. It is in that pause that I situate academic freedom. In that space, it is unmistakable how, as developed in the US context, academic freedom delimits its affordances to, to a select few, as it not only occludes the labor conditions that characterize the academy, but also affirms the onto epistemologies of liberalism and neoliberalism that continue to rationalize and thereby legitimate the ravages of capitalism and colonialism. As may be familiar to you in the United States, academic freedom is generally understood in the ways elaborated by the American Association of uh, University Professors 1940 statement on principles of academic freedom and tenure, to which in 1970 the AAUP offered interpretive comments. Most US universities and colleges have adopted its principles in the formulation of their employment procedures and institutional aims. They are in this sense embedded in the very architecture of contemporary higher education. I'm not sure how many of you have rec read the actual language of the statement. I hadn't until I couldn't not because of the ubiquity of its invocation in the past decade or so. Uh, the AAUP's introduction of the statement includes such ex explanations as the following. So on the screens is the entire text. I'm not going to read through the entire text. I'm just um, reading excerpts. Institutions of higher education are conducted for the common good and not to further the interest of either the individual teacher or the institution as a whole. The common good depends upon the free search for truth and its free exposition. Freedom in research is fundamental to the advancement of truth. Academic freedom in its teaching aspect is fundamental for the protection of the rights of the teacher in teaching and of the student to freedom in learning. 
It carries with it duties correlative with rights. Tenure is a means to certain ends, specifically freedom, to, freedom of teaching and research and, extra, and of extramural activities, and a sufficient degree of economic security to make the profession attractive to men and women of ability. Freedom and economic security, hence tenure, are indispensable to the success of an institution in fulfilling its obligations to its students and to society. Academic freedom, the statement continues, is constituted by three features. One, teachers are entitled to full freedom in research and in the publication of the results. Two, teachers are entitled to freedom in the classroom in discussing their subject, but they should be careful not to introduce into their teaching controversial matter, which has no relation to the subject. Three, college and university teachers are citizens, members of a learned profession, and officers of an educational institution. When they speak or write as citizens, they should be free from institutional censorship or discipline, but their special position in the community imposes special obligations. As scholars and educational officers, they should remember that the public may judge their profession and their institution by their utterances. Hence, they should at all times be accurate, should exercise appropriate restraint, should, allow, should show respect for the opinions of others, and should make every effort to indicate that they are not speaking for the institution. I want to draw our attention to how the statement links academic freedom and tenure, that is by means of constellating special privileges that come with being a professional, with obligations to behave appropriately, and job security. This three-part constellation, the AAUP makes clear, is necessary to avoid embarrassing the profession, which is itself justified as necessary for the common good. Academic freedom, in other words, comes to us as a facet of and bound by professionalization. Part of the significance of the professional boundaries of academic freedom lies in helping us understand how the structures that give academic freedom meaning bolster the neoliberalization of the academy we are experiencing now, especially as regards the exponential growth of contingent labor as well as heightened individualization. And here I return to the AAUP's history to explain. The association was founded in 1915 by a group of professors from such private exclusive research universities as Johns Hopkins and Harvard, who were concerned with limiting the power of governing boards in curricular and thus personnel matters. College and, uh, college and university governing boards were at that time formed by business people and others with vested interests in the kinds of education offered. In the 19th century, US uh, higher education had undergone considerable challenge in the face of the establishment of Darwinism, which undermined the explanatory power of religious orthodoxies um, that had defined the curricula of colleges to date, and the establishment of public research universities in the Humboldtian model drawn from Germany. The social position and authority of faculty, as well as, uh, as, well as universities and colleges, was in flux. By 1915, the founders of AAUP were also responding to the dismissal, um, dismissal or refusal to hire faculty on the basis of economic viewpoints, specifically socialist, at odds with those govern on governing boards. In short, AAUP's founders had many reasons to be concerned about the prospects of teaching and research given the governance structures of higher education of the era. That they decided on professionalization as the route necessary to giving faculty the kind of authority to self-government enjoyed by professions like medicine and law is suggestive of the strength and contours of the bourgeois imaginary in play at that era. And it is in this context and with these aims that the principles in the 1915 articulation were formulated in 1940. As Tim Kaine persuasively documents, the elaboration of academic freedom in the 1940 statement was consequent to often contestatory interactions among several different organizations in the interwar years, including the AAUP, the Association of American Colleges, now AACU, the, ACLA, uh, the ACLU, and the American Federation of Teachers, the AFT. Kaine notes among these interactions the frictions between the AFT and the AAUP, Friction that can fairly be cast as resulting from the difference between the interests of labor and the aims of establishing an elite professional class as the AAUP sought to do. The elitism of the AAUP of these early days was expressed in part by its insistence on the expertise of faculty and their unique ability to judge the merits of each other's work. At the time, what was fairly construed as the overreach of college and university governing boards in making hiring and firing decisions underwrote this insistence on expert knowledge. 
In short, this early iteration of the AUP understood and rationalized professionalization by means of an insistence on the distinctive judgments of disciplinary peers as necessary to securing freedom from external forces. It is in the context of McCarthyism that academic freedom as elaborated in the 1940 statement is legalized, specifically by the US Supreme Court's recognition of a constitutional interest in it, and in ways that sediment an understanding of expert or disciplinary knowledge as necessary to the national interest. In providing universities with cover of academic freedom, the court concretized disciplinarity insofar as the test of academic freedom defers to professional scholarly standards. In Sweezy v. New Hampshire, a 1957 case involving University of New Hampshire professor Paul Sweezy, the court found that the state's attorney general had unconstitutionally invaded Sweezy's guaranteed rights of expression and due process. Sweezy had refused to answer questions about his suspected affiliations with the Communist Party. In its decision, the court found Sweezy's academic freedom as it pertains to the intellectual life of a university more compelling than it did the, the government's interest. The court in 1967 in Kiishian v. Board of Regents more specifically identified academic freedom as, quote, a special concern of the First Amendment, which does not tolerate laws that cast a pall of orthodoxy over the classroom. Our nation is deeply committed to safeguarding academic freedom, which is of transcendent value to all of us and not just the teachers involved. The court's interest in academic freedom may be understood, as Robert Post suggests, in terms of the furtherance of democratic competence, the cognitive empowerment of persons within public discourse, which in part ex uh, depends on their access to disciplinary knowledge. This is knowledge, Post explains, that is understood to be necessary for self-governance and democratic legitimation. That is, the Supreme Court affirmed the importance of disinterested expert knowledge by positing society's reliance on it as, invested in universe, as it invested universities with distinct constitutional, which is to say national, value. It takes no special insight to recognize that the legacies of the professional elitism through which academic cri freedom crystallizes are part of the very terrain against which we contemporarily struggle. While the AAUP was certainly was not solely responsible for the concretization of disciplinarity and an elitist forms of expert knowledge, that these aims and logics grounded the articulation of the principles deepens our understanding of the difficulty of delegitimizing disciplinarity, the purview of expert knowledge, and the competencies necessary to gauge each other's work. The absence of the language of labor in the articulation of academic freedom also helps to explain why unionization has come generally late and haltingly, if at all, to the professoriate. This history of uh, professionalization also makes obvious that because academic freedom is reserved for tenured faculty members, the split between tenure track and contract instructors in higher education acts as a built-in leverage against the ability to teach and research freely in the contemporary context when the vast and growing majority of teachers at the college level are contingent workers. Simply, the fewer tenured faculty there are, the less academic freedom there is or can be. In other words, even staying within the given parameters of academic freedom and its relationship to the common good as instated by the 1940 statement, we can recognize its limitations as a defense against the kinds of incursions by external forces, here the forces constituting the reigning political economy, that it was designed to forestall. Indeed, a perhaps paranoid but nonetheless plausible take on the phenomenal growth of contingent labor is its advantage to those who benefit from the minimization of academic freedom that is, those who benefit from the anti-intellectualism that has so robustly accompanied the convergence of the interests of state and of capital characterizing the current conjuncture. But neither can we be satisfied with this framing of academic freedom or by the invocation of the version of the common good it posits. For we know that the prevailing conception of the common good, prevailing today as it was in 1915 and 1940, if in different iterations, is that which obscures its own historicity, including especially how it secures itself in modern nationalist terms through rationalization of the dispossession of native peoples and through logics that buttress the dichotomies between good and bad subjects, the public versus the criminal, the immigrant versus the alien, the citizen versus the terrorists, and so on. In short, the dichotomies that are a key technology of racialization. Understanding that professionalization, academic freedom, and US nationalism are intimately linked projects vis-a-vis -vis this posited common good also reminds us how academic freedom here is implicated in the US nation's contribution to producing the social and political unrest characterizing those places identified in the Scholars at Risk, uh, at Risk Network's report, Venezuela, South Africa, Niger, Cameroon, Turkey, and India, where violence on campuses has erupted 
whether through its economic policies or military incursion, as recently exemplified in Niger. U.S. academic freedom may, in this, may be understood in this way to be linked to the suppression of academic freedom elsewhere. We can also re recall how academic freedom was used to criticize the curricular transformations wrought by the social movements and students and teachers of the 1960s and 70s, how political correctness emerged as a term of the culture wars to criticize what was cast as the politicization of the academy against its uh, putatively true nature. Such criticisms and deployments of academic freedom elucidate the specifically nationalist character of education. That academic freedom can be used by both those arguing for inclusion and exclusion is symptomatic of its connection to nationalism and liberalism in the US. As Francis Julia Reamer explains of the discursive packaging of Arizona legislation regarding Mexican American studies and guns on campus, quote, the stars and stripes of liberalism are used to justify both advocacy for and opposition to them. Liberalism affords the vocabulary to both establish and contest political authority. According to her convincing account, state officials took the position that Mexican American studies advances ethnic chauvinism and is thus antithetical to the sacrosanct liberal value of equality, while teachers and students countered by invoking civil rights history and idioms to argue that Mexican American studies advanced the liberal democratic project. Meanwhile, advocates for campus carry relied on individual rights arguments, while even though, while, quote, even those who advocate for increased gun control pay their respects to the Second Amendment before they offer their rebuttals. As Rima rightly notes, this rights-based discourse obscures the economic interests behind gun initiatives, that is, the interests of the $4 billion gun industry. Rima concludes, quote, in 21st century Arizona, liberalism is our system of representation. Both sides of the political continuum, assimilationists and pluralists, pro-gun and anti-gun activists, we all wrap ourselves in the flag. Uh, close quote. Until and unless we can defunction this epistemology, academic freedom will remain exactly that, a construct the usefulness of which is delimited to the defense of liberal ideology as it rationalizes U.S. nationalism. Section two, uh, extramural speech, or the problem of the individual. In 1960, Leo Koch, an assistant professor of biology at the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign, not so far from here, wrote a letter in response to an article published in the Daily Illini, the student newspaper, which he signed with his institutional title. As John Wilson reports, Koch was responding to a multi-authored forum, forum titled Sex Ritualized, which in Wilson's words, lamented how, un, quote, lamented how unfortunate it was that men were obliged to be smooching with women in a sorority until the one o'clock dong relieves them from their chivalrous duty. The authors complained in this forum that, quote, male-female relations on campus have stultified into a predetermined ritual, close quote. In essence, they were complaining that they were unable to do anything more than smooch. Uh, Koch's response, which was published a few days later, chided the paper for failing to acknowledge the moral and social norms that sustained everything from outdated Victorian codes of behavior to reigning double standards for the sexual lives of men and women. Koch concluded, quote, with modern contraceptives and medical advice readily available at the nearest drugstore, or at least a family physician, there is no valid reason why sexual intercourse should not be condoned among those sufficiently mature to engage in it without social consequences and without violating their own codes of morality and ethics. Driven in large part by a figure described as, quote, a right-wing, anti-communist, former missionary to China whose daughter was a student at the university, a campaign to fire Koch was organized in the state legislature and among parents. A pamphlet denouncing Koch was circulated, which had described his letter as, quote, an audacious attempt to subvert the religious and moral foundations of America. University of Illinois administrators, a mere 10 days after Koch's response was published, and without consulting his faculty peers as the principles of academic freedom warranted, determined his letter to be irresponsible and voted to fire him. The university president at that time, David Dodds Henry, quote, declared that Koch's views were offensive, repugnant, and contrary to commonly accepted standards of morality, and that his espousal of these views could be interpreted as an encouragement of immoral behavior. For these reasons, he should be relieved of his university duties. This case turned out to be formative in the shaping of the AUP stance on extramural utterances. 
Until then, as established in the 1940 statement, extramural utter utterances had to meet uh, professional standards insofar as faculty were enjoined to exercise appropriate restraint, show respect for the opinions of others, and make every effort to indicate that they are not speaking for the institution. At issue in 1960 for the AAUP was whether or not a standard of responsibility, conceptualized in terms of a, quote, gentleman scientist model, should be retained. While the organization censured the university for failing to follow due process by not consulting with faculty before dismissal, as well as for what it judged to be the disproportionate punishment for Koch's behavior, the politics of professional respectability loomed large over its consideration of this case. It is, of course, bitingly ironic, given the University of Illinois' recent flagrant demonstration of its unwillingness to heed its expert faculty in matters of personnel and curriculum when those faculty are in American Indian studies, that the school responded to censure following its treatment of Koch by transforming its processes and articulating exceptionally strongly worded policies on academic freedom and tenure. The problem the AAUP faced was how to isolate speech as a citizen from that of speech as a professional. The 1915 principles and the 1940 statement had made the distinction based on the relationship of such speech to areas of expertise. If a professor spoke on a topic within his realm of expertise, and it really was his um, realm of expertise there, no um, other genders there, um, that speech was to be held up to the normative standards of the profession. If that speech was unrelated to his expertise and removed from the spaces where professional obligations hold, the classroom for one, then it should be protected under the umbrella of academic freedom as a matter of the rights of a citizen to engage freely in public discourse. Moreover, the manner of speech matters insofar as it ought to take into account the unique social position of professional scholars and thus be presented in an appropriately dignified way. While the AUP undertook renovation to its understanding of extramural speech following the Koch case, and in part as a result of both McCarthyism and the social and intellectual movements of the 1950s and 60s, such renovation resulting in a statement that more actively affirms the professor's right to extramural speech, its current position retains a relationship between the grounds for dismissal and extramural speech as an indicator of professional competence. More importantly, beyond the AUP's debates on these matters, we can observe across the landscape of education at all levels an energetic and proliferating reliance on codes insisting on civility. We can readily acknowledge the historic and ongoing usefulness of this mandate, of, uh, mandate to civility in the service of dispossession, subjugation, and devastation of people and planet. The civilizing and Christianizing mission of early higher education in the United States resonates strongly today. Perhaps especially in the aftermath of 9-11 uh, and with the unapologetic un resurgence of the kind of efforts to subordinate and censor intellectual activity to the interests of the US nation state uh, associated with McCarthyism. So I'm remembering especially the Patriot Act and how quickly it was passed. And the corollary ways that the state has redoubled its efforts to secure Christianity as the US nation's religious and moral foundation through the regulation of the nation's boundaries that both the content and manner of expression continues to be at issue is patently clear. As the dismissal of and a refusal to hire people expressing support for Palestinians or criticism of Israel in ways that challenge the gentlemanly model of speech attests, as well as the suspension of others for public remarks made in response to anti-black racism and white supremacy indicates, the judgment of incivility still operates as part of the machinery of suppression of illiberal dissent. We may refuse the liberal framework of academic freedom and the dictates of professionalism that ask us to consider the civility of speech, to ask instead who gets to express themselves with incivility, through state-sanctioned violence, for example, or through racist, sexually violent, and white supremacist discourse and activities, say, and for whom is incivil speech impermissible? Um, and Ruthie may hear her formulation from a different context um, in that question. In, Ruthie Gilmore. Um, in fact, we know that it is speech outside the powerfully structured domain of civility that is a practice of freedom, of the freedom that is before and beyond the academy, civic society, or broadly the liberal order. It is the freedom that is not given or even taken, but is already and has always been ours, the freedom which inheres in existence. This freedom punctures perhaps the biggest ruse of liberal freedom, namely the idea that freedom is something to be given or earned. Stretch time around the case of Leo Koch's academic freedom and the centrality of the regulation of desires and behaviors to which we give the name gender and sexuality and the political uses of sex panics come to the fore as key facets of the world liberal freedom attempts to secure. 
stretch time in the histories of Orientalism, U.S. imperialism, and the rationalities of racial capitalism that give rise to the figure of the right-wing anti-communist party former missionary to China may be brought to bear. The given paradigms by which we are to understand and use academic freedom isolate utterances and individuals to insist that the contexts that matter are professional and institutional. But if we stretch time, the potent context of modern nationalism becomes strongly palpable. In other words, the pedagogical and illiberal mode allows us to remember that the problem isn't an individual's decision to speak on a given subject and in a given way. The problem is in the, in the material power of the very conception of the autonomous rights-bearing citizen iterated by academic freedom and that marks its liberal nationalist grounds. This is not, I think, simply a matter of complicating the distinctions between, the profession, between professional and citizen, citizenly speech, but rather one of understanding that the distinction itself relies on the assumption of the individual autonomy, of individual autonomy in decision making, without regard for either the historicity of that understanding of autonomy or the social nature of choice. Speech deemed incivil, I believe, uh, better or illiberally, uh, is better or illiberally understood as speech expressed in the absence of a choice to do so. When conditions are such that speech is not willed but eruptive, when one cannot choose not to speak in confronting racism and settler colonialism and cis heteropatriarchy as the expressions provoking recent academic freedom cases have done. Such speech, incivil speech, is an expression of the freedom that was and is ours before and beyond. Section three, by way of closing, the work of associating. I am inspired by how this association, its constituency and our collective commitments to speaking truth to power have come to take its current shape. I think of the planning and labor of people, of women of color and like-minded people, in and outside of the ASA, who refused the exclusionary nature of the academy and organized in ways to remake it, who afforded the shifts to the world and this association that allow this annual meeting to be, for so many of us, a place where defensiveness is neither necessary nor useful. In one sense, what I've been doing in and with this address is asking us collectively, given all the conditions to which de the Declaration of Academic Freedom's vulnerability refers, what will we have wanted the ASA to have been and done some decades hence? What difference can our work of associating make? Through associating, the AAUP professionalized the activities of teaching and research. Through associating, what will we do? Here are some of the things I'm thinking. It will be necessary to continue to proliferate the unlearning of inherited ways of knowing and being, to take flight from dissent in ways that reckon with the contradictions and entanglements of history that necessitate thinking nation, race, gender, sexuality, coloniality, indigeneity, class, and ableism all at once, which is to say, to be ever attentive to the complex ways in which power operates to disorganize life. This kind of reckoning is difficult. It requires not merely acknowledging, but living and thinking inside the cacophony, to borrow Jody Bird's term, to allow unlearning to remake us and elucidate other worlds. In this, what I'm referring to as, the, as illiberal intellectual traditions are vital to undoing powerful ignorance and the power of ignorance, that is, of anti-intellectualism. One of the things we learn from these traditions over and over again is that it will take all of us to make sense out of cacophony, to elaborate the rationalities and sensibilities and structures that allow life to flourish. Stretch time around the work of associating, and part of what you will find, I believe, is instead of defensiveness, the kind of collegiality that help us make and hold up our worlds, of a form of relationality only possible when uninvested in professional advancement or in the defense of institutions or principles, but rather inclined always toward people and the planet in their inseparability. Collegiality gives rise to the deep joy that inheres as much as risk in the fact of being and being together. It lives in what Sylvia Winter described as the unimaginability of writing an autobiography because of the imperative of the collective. It resounds in the ethos of interrelationality organizing the Kambahi River Collective, so vital to the critique of capital and empire they advance. It is a form of the mutuality Sandy Grand emphasizes as necessary to undoing settler colonial education. It pervades the cr collective creative imaginaries of this bridge called My Back. It is an iteration of Jose Munoz's theorization of being with. It is what brings us back to the table, to this table, to this annual meeting, even when there is conflict, antagonism, difficulty, risk. The collegiality 
uh, these people, of their work, their collegiality, made us possible and continues in and through us. What I'm describing is a pedagogy of dissent, an, organizing a, an organized approach to unlearning grounded in the world and founded in generosity and compassion, understood to be essential to social transformation. Collegiality, this pedagogy, uh, means, is a name for doing work even, when that, when that doing might mean an undoing of belief, of job security, social standing, sometimes of self, when that, undoing, when that doing requires courage for the sake of the collective. I remember here that Paulo Freire opens Pedagogy of the Oppressed by emphasizing generosity and love. These are, these are the grounds and affordances of collegiality as a mode of refusing subjection. Since I heard Roderick Ferguson speak yesterday with characteristic shiver-inducing brilliance about courage as a condition of possibility for intellectual activity, about the interdisciplinarity given to us through social movements of an intellectual formation that creates and proliferates new forms of courage, of the courage to be non-aligned with the powerful. I've been thinking both about exactly how right he is um, and about how courage is pressed upon us as much as defensiveness. Courage is conditioned by the fact of vulnerability and its exacerbation. It is activated not by individual choice, but because circumstances make it such that there is no choice but to be courageous, non-aligned, even insurrectionary. No choice but to take up the insurrectionary work of intellectual activity that refuses to be disciplined, professional, civil. Given racism in its intersectional and state-sanctioned forms, given all the ways the world, is, uh, the world Unevenness may be indexed by the bodies with which we experience it. For some, the everyday, the everyday act of walking on the street is courageous. For some, academic environments require bravery simply to enter. For some, courage is, in these and manifold other ways, a fact of daily ex existence. This courage learned experientially gives rise to the understanding that courage as teachers and scholars and students elicits work in the face of uncertainty, work that elaborates the genealogies of the insurrectionary forms and formations of knowledge of non-aligned uh, non -aligned pedagogies of dissent. This is to say that we will need to remember that risk has always accompanied dissent, and that risk asks us what we will give up, not in a sacrificial model, but through the collective expression of being, a collegiality that remakes ourselves, that reveals the self to be collective, constitutively communal, relational, plural. Indeed, we will need to remember that risk inheres in the very fact of existence, that the differential distribution of risk means there is no universal safe space, and to be ever mindful of how the desire to inoculate ourselves from this vulnerability aligns all too well with the interests of the security state. More policing, more surveillance, more laws, more bureaucracy, more defensiveness has yet to produce more life or invulnerability. We will need to continue to mobilize to address immediate needs. And through the pedagogical, not only, but distinctly through the pedagogical, we may take the longer view necessary to organize around the conditions that induce dissent as part of a collective, collaborative, collegial effort to refuse, refute, and defunction them. The work of associating may itself be pedagogical in this regard. If we will have been able to continue to create time to learn and unlearn with all that that implies as to the organization we will have to do, the organizing we will have to do, the structures we'll need to put in place, simply the work we will need to do, we will in, have made a world, in fact, worth defending. In the end, I'm simply observing that stretching time, creating time, is our collective superhero power as, our, as teachers. We must use it courageously. Thank you. Thank you. So there's a wonderful reception out there, so go be collegial. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Now you have to go <laughs> exit the room. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Okay, you guys have to stop now. Thank you.